In 2018, the Utah Department of Health found that suicide is the leading cause of death for children 10 to 17. A troubling statistic, the Utah Shakespeare Festival aims to change with an interactive play that uses humor and realism to spark honest conversations about mental health. Okay, so we're gonna need some help during the show. Um, I'm gonna be up here calling out lots of random numbers and I would just love if you guys would be willing to yell out the answers to the cards of the number I call out. Yeah? Okay. So in Utah, it is mm, like sixth in the nation for uh, highest rate of suicide in the country. And, um, and when it comes to teenagers 12 to 19, we are number one. We are the highest rated state for suicide. Coffee? You bet. You? Who's in love? Who wants to, <laughs> all your hands went down. <laughs> You're in love, great. Will you say number 1,857, planning a declaration of love? Thank you. Our purpose in doing this, our mission with the Utah Shakespeare Festival and the state legislature, which we partnered with, is to get a discussion going about depression and about suicide. All right, here's the deal. I'm going to do this one for The story of probably the first half of my character's life starts when I'm seven years old and I'm taken to the hospital to see my mom after she's attempted to take her life. It actually goes through and, and it talks about how the storyteller has dealt with it throughout their life. I'm gonna tell you a story, and it's about a list. And the list began after her first attempt. A list of everything brilliant about the world, everything worth living for. Number one. Ice cream. Yes, that's right. Number two. Water fight. Yes. Number three. Scandalous. <laughs> Number four. The color yellow. As a teenager, I, I think there's a lot you go through. I can understand that it can be difficult in this state, and that's really hard to hear because it's my hometown and my home state, and I'm so grateful to be from here, but I find it incredibly important that we get to as many schools as possible and just get a conversation going. Now, I started this list on November 9th, 1998. I was picked up late from school and taken to the hospital, which is where my mom was. Now, normally it's my mom who picks me up, and normally she's on time, and normally I travel in the back because I'm seven and I make things sticky, but today it's my dad, and it's late. And he leans over and opens the front passenger door. Eventually I, I got into the car. The radio was on. He'd been smoking with the windows down. He'd been smoking with the windows down. There we go, there we go. Now actually, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna be my dad and you're gonna be me as a seven-year-old. Now, just sit right there. You don't have to do much, just immediately after everything I say, I'd like you to reply, why? Okay. Why? There we go. Put it on your seatbelt. Why? Because cars can be dangerous. Why? Because other drivers don't always pay attention. Well, because there's a lot to think about when you're an adult. There's work to do and bills to pay and relationships to sustain, and there is never enough time to do it all. Why not? Because I, <laughs> I don't know. Can, can you just stop asking me questions and, and put your seatbelt on? Why? <laughs> because we're going to the hospital. Why? Because that's where your mother is because she hurt herself. Why? Because she's sad. Why is she sad? I don't know. Why don't you know? I just don't. At least, that's how I like to remember it. We actually just sat in silence. The only thing he did say, and I'd like you to repeat this very loud for everyone to hear, your mother's done something stupid. Your mother's done something stupid. And I didn't know what that meant. Coming into this, I don't, I don't know if I really knew what to expect. I wanted to be open and, and ready to receive what they had. And I stared at her while she looked at me from the car. A student came up to me one time and he said that he'd attempted to take his own life 11 times. And, and he asked if he could give me a hug, and, and I, I said, sure, that's absolutely fine. And so we hugged, and then he said he finally understands what it must be like 
when his mom gets the call every time he attempts. And that was, that was, that was huge. That horrible feeling when something is broken and can never be fixed. The trap door just swinging open. Fight or flight. Or stay as still as you can. It's a wonderful privilege, but also a little bit hard sometimes when, when a student comes up to you and says, I relate with everything that you've said. I've attempted myself. I've felt that. I've been there. I have an uncle who passed away of suicide. I have my own mother who has struggled with depression. Sam's note said that he loved me and that when I was ready, we should try again. My hope is that by doing that and by putting these people in these positions that, that feel vulnerable but still safe for them, that they feel like they can then talk about it because it has been statistically proven that talking about suicide does not cause it. It actually will help it. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hey, um, this is my first session. Uh, I've avoided doing this. I'm, you know, American. <laughs> um, I've come to find out that it's important to talk about things, um, particularly the things that are the hardest to talk about. When I was younger, I was so much better at being happy, you know, at, at like feeling joy. As a grown up, man, being conscious of the problems in this world, the complexities, the tragedies, the disappointments. I, I don't think I could ever fully allow myself to feel joy. I'm just not very good at it. But it's helpful to know that there are other people who feel the same way. 80% of people who are having thoughts of suicide can find their way out of that and back to happiness. One of the lines in the show, I have some advice for anyone who's been contemplating suicide. It's really simple advice, it's this. Don't do it. Things get better. They may not always get brilliant, but they do get better. <laughs>